you remember last week was, if you remember from the sheet order and from Shoal, that last week was Mahmad Har Sinai, was, um, was the revelation, was Moshe going up and getting the Ten Commandments and everything that surrounded that, um, and, so, and a few things that succeeded that. This week's Parsha starts off with the phrase, Ve'ele um, Hamishpatim, and these are the ordinances. And if you look at the first source on top, there you have it. This is the first pasa, the first uh, verse of the entire parsha. Ve'ele hamishpatim asher tasim lifnehem. These are the statutes or ordinances that you, Moshe, Hashem is talking to Moshe, that you shall place before them. Okay. Um, now, what's interesting is we're at a point in, in the Torah here, in the Torah readings, um, parsha titro mishpatim teruma, we'll see next week also, that brings up the question of whether the Torah is written in chronological order multiple times. We, we talked about it briefly last week. When Yitro comes, the question of whether Yitro has come really at the point in the chronological order of things that the Torah presents it or not. We have it now also, whether these mishpatim are given post-revelation, part of revelation, next week we'll see it again. And commentators are pretty consistent in their approach to this, where Rashi, at, where Rashi and other, other, other medieval Rishonim, um, including even Ezra, I believe, um, to, are, are very much accepting of this notion, en mukdam batorah, there's no necessarily, that the, the Torah is not necessarily written in chronological order, wasn't delivered to us in chronological order. Um, Ramban is sort of the standout Rishon, the standout commentator, who insists that as, whenever it's possible, we have to assume that the Torah was given, that the stories, the, the plot, so to speak, right, of the Torah was handed over to Moshe and then to us, reflecting chronological order. So we are actually going to go with that assumption, not because I necessarily prefer it over the other, but because it will lead us, I think, to, for our purposes, to interesting conversation with the Ramban's approach, and we'll revisit it a number of times. So assuming that the Torah that was presented in this case, in the chronological order, I'm sorry, I'm going to weakness here because assuming the Torah was presented in chronological order. So the first question that comes up that I'd like to bring up is, you're welcome, looking at this list, can you detect any connections between what you know are the contents of the Ten Commandments and these details? And by the way, I could have gone even more detailed within these details. That's how much, how much, how much detail is in Mishpati. Well, well, the second one surely is a low tier, seems to be connected to low tier itself. Right, so certainly so. we can identify, we can connect this one in some ways with murder, not in some ways, it's up directly. Yeah. Anything else? Cursing Hashem, you know, to Right, Lotisa, right, exactly, cursing, good. Yeah. What is curse category? What curse? Oh, like not, you know, not uh, using uh, yeah. God's name in vain. Mm -hmm. Justice and honesty, you're not supposed to lie and cheat. Okay, good. That where is that as part of the Ten Commandments? I know that it's here, but where is it in the Ten Commandments? Not supposed to comment your neighbors. Uh, okay, so we're going to come to that one soon, right? But you could you could potentially connect lying and cheating with loti no stealing mm -hmm. with lotisa, right? Because lying often implies Swearing, some, swearing that something is true when it's not, and using God's name. So there are some that we can connect directly with the Ten Commandments, others that might be a little bit more of a stretch. But certainly, if you look at it, there's, it's not, um, there doesn't seem to be a direct kind of ordered correlation, right? The first one is in Zanochi, the second few are, you know, and so on until, until uh, not coveting. So let's look a little bit at what Mefarshim have to say about these connections between Mishpatim, this the bulk of this parsha, which is the outline of Mishpatim, and the, um, and, the, and the Ten Commandments themselves. The first two Mefarshim that you have here, the first two commentators that you have here, are Sephorno and Ramban. Now, Sephorno, I actually presented them to you in reverse chronological, by reverse biographical order, um, for a reason. Sephorno was lived in the um, 16th, 15th into the 16th century in Italy, and Ramban in the um, 
12th into 13th century in Spain. I presented them in reverse chronological order because one, in, in some ways, Ramban expounds upon, expands upon Sparno. So if we look at Sparno, here's what he says. And as usual, I'm going to read this in, in, in Hebrew. Follow me in English, please, if you'd like. And I'll, I'll interject a few things in English also. So Sparno on this pasuk. Ve'ele ha-mishpatim, hineva parasha shem ba'la, hayta ha'azhara shelo tachmod kol asher l'ra'echa, ve'ele ha-mishpatim asher ban yeda ha'adam ma'hu kol asher l'ra'echa. Right? So I think, Ronnie, you may have said, with Rani, you said coveting, talking about coveting, good. So what Sparno says is exactly, it's correlates in some ways to what you mentioned, the idea of coveting. Um, and what he says is that these mishpatim, everything about what we're about, to, you're about to read in the parsha, it's, are, are correlated with not coveting, with not coveting other, other people's things, right? And not just your husband's wife, I mean your friend's wife, but, but not coveting other people's things, right? Husband could have a wife. Sometimes you just talk and don't really know what you're going to say. <laughs> I assume I'm not the only one. Um, so what does Farno say? We're left off with this, um, with this last piece. And, and the obvious question is, well, how do you know what's yours and what's not? Maybe it's not such an obvious question, by the way, right? Meaning, we, on some level, it's intuitively we know what that means. But, he, but Sparno is saying that here in Mishpatim, you go into more, he goes into more details about tangible things that, go, that belong to us. In other words, what it means to own things, to be respectful to those things, and I'm going to elaborate on Sparno, to have relationships with those things, which all of these, these in various ways um, relate to, although not every one of them. And so let's, he's, he's, he indicates that these mishpatim are in some ways elaborating on this last of the Ten Commandments. If you look at Ramban, he says that, but then goes into a little more detail. Ve'ele ha-mishpatim, keneged lo tachmod, Right? He also says his relation to you shall not covet. Right? If you don't know all these specific laws, you might think it belongs to you. You might think that we all live on a kibbutz, right? And what's yours is mine, and what's mine is yours. So there is a certain, there's a sense here he's saying in which knowing the laws of, 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 um, of ownership and torts and, and damages helps us helps us identify what's appropriate and what's crossing the line. Right? So this part is getting is going to get us into more details. Right? The entire Torah is dependent on justice. Right? If there's no justice, then what is the Torah really for, at some level, right? Um, and so, and so, you, it, right after you give, you present the broad strokes. Morning. Right after you're presented the broad strokes, these these um, these formative ten commandments. So now let's go into detail about what what it is to have mishpat. What it is to have the rule of law. And then watch what he does. V'chen yifaresh be'ele hamishpatim hamishpat ba'avodah zara u'v'chibud avaim. So what he's doing here is saying that not a, ultimately this actually isn't just about lo tachmod because as we started saying before we looked at Sforno, yeah, some of these we could easily correlate with not coveting, but some of them don't seem it would be a little bit of a stretch to say that, right? That that um, that um, uh, working the land and letting it rest and observing Shabbat. Like some of these don't necessarily correlate in an obvious way with coveting. I could argue that, um, that you know, uh, treatment of strangers has to do with that, but it would be a little bit of a stretch. Ramban is suggesting that there are, there are a number of the Ten Commandments that these could fit into. I'm not going to take you through how each one fits into the broad strokes, but just, just to present a perspective that this isn't just a litany of Mishpatim, in, but that there is a, there's a, a kind of working order to this. There's a working correlation between the Mishpatim and the Ten Commandments. Okay. What I want to do right now is take you to a, a kind of a contemporary uh, look at this. Rav Avram Walfish, who um, has a really beautiful shear um, about about Mishpatim and about this exact topic that we're talking about. Anyone want to read the English? I don't. Know. Anyone want to read? Yes, please. At first glance, it would seem hard to find a greater contrast than the overwhelming mysterium tremendum of last week's 
Synod Synod Synodic <laughs> Revelation, and this week's minute attention to mundane detail, the, conject the conjunctive vav connecting these two portrayals of Jewish religious experience highlights the contrast between them, while binding them together as consecutive points on a spiritual continuum. Indeed, the awesome experiential peak of witnessing the divine presence and hearing his voice is not the goal or the acme of Israelite religion. Judaism is not a religion of peak experiences, but of living in accordance with the divine will. Hence, the syntax of our Parsha's opening, the mundane statues of Mishpatim, are not an independent unit, but the direct continuation of the Sanaitic revelation. Okay. Right. I, I, I actually do find it beautiful, which is my, which is my understanding. Um, Abraham Maslow in parentheses, those are Rabbi Walfish's, not mine. So is anyone familiar with, with Maslow's um, psychology? So the, some of his, some of what he wrote, um, his humanistic psychology has been either discredited or um, research has not borne out that's necessarily, uh, that necessarily applies in all situations. But Abraham Maslow um, has this um, idea that there are, um, that in order for a person, one of his many ideas is that in order for a person to self-actualize, that's the, um, that's the term that he uses, to sort of become the best version of him or herself, the best, the highest, reach the highest potential that he or she can, that person has to, has to go through certain peak experiences. And peak experiences are ones of transcendent happiness. Um, you know, being in love is one of the more examples that he gives, that, that in going through certain peak experiences that are the height of emotional bliss, um, can help a person reach his or her highest potential. And so, obviously, what, um, what Rav Wapish is saying here is that whether or not that's true, whether or not that's true that it's necessary for people to go through that, it's not what Judaism is about. Right? That ultimately, Judaism, Judaism is not about reaching moments of transcendence, it's about the everyday. What, what is your reaction to that? Does that speak to you? Do you think that revelation type experiences or uh, kind of a height of emotional experiences on a religious plane are critical? Do you, do you disagree with Papa Fish? I'm curious to know what your experience is. Yes? I think that the spark of spirituality has to be some kind of revelation uh -huh. because, because faith is that. It's faith. There's no, there's no proof to faith. Uh -huh. But yet the observance of Judaism is the day in and day out, and by doing the day in and day out, you show your belief and your faith in Hashem. So it has to begin with some kind of transcendent I, experience. I think so, but not of a love kind, but of just an individual acknowledgement um, of your maker. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Yes. I think each of us is different, mm -hmm. and what affects one won't necessarily Julia Rose, please come up to the detail. I remember when someone was saying about the um, the rational, yes. and proving, you know, God, etc., yeah. um, and that that brings you know people to accept the Torah. And somebody else in the room said. Ridiculous. Also, Leola Wasserman, please come up here, Leola Wasserman. And I know that that's what did it for me, mm -hmm. so I realized that different strokes for different folks. Right, definitely. And even if you look at the history of our commentators, right, you have Rambam, who is very much a rationalist, um, although he had a very, very emotive, emotive and, and um, uh, contemplative, he's not philosophical side, but Rambam was known to be a rationalist, and you have um, people who followed him and who preceded him who insisted that every mitzvah in the Torah has a potentially locatable um, reason and purpose, and then you have the more emotive commentary, and you could, uh, ancient through contemporary, that's more about the, the experience of it, right, and the day-to-day the -day observance, but the emotional experience of it. When we teach Jewish, ph Jewish philosophy at Maya Note, one of the units that we've taught, that we often teach, is proofs for the existence of God. And those proofs for the existence of God that, that sources ancient to modern incorporate include everything from what's considered rational, logical proof. It, you know, and the question, in my mind, the question of whether it's, that even that is proof is, is a little bit, you know, I, I, it, it feels dubious to me, but that's my own, my own subjectivity. Um, 
but they go from what are considered rational proofs all the way to the argument that the experience of life itself, the experience of the world around me, is sufficient proof as opposed to a you know logically organized uh, set of proofs. So yes, for sure, th for sure, you know, we have to we come to this with different experiences. I think in some ways, the the um, common the um, um, closeness, right, of of Mamad Har Sinai revelation to these Mishpatim accounts for both of these, right? Accounts for both of these personality types, accounts for both of these inspirations. Because for some people, um, knowing the knowing these Mishpatim and understanding what the day to day should be like and what God wants from us, you know, minute by minute, is inspiration itself and is motivating itself. And for other people, these transcendent moments, these sparks, are really what get us going. And I think for many people, there's some combination, right, of both that make us feel connected. But what God is doing here, right, according to Bob Walfish, is indicating Sinai, Ramad Har Sinai is critically important, but your day-to-day -day is really about, about the day-to-day, -day, about how to behave minute to minute. And what Sforno and Ramban, Ramban are doing, are there, is they're connecting the two, right? They're the connectors. They're the ones who are saying, the two are the two are just um, inseparable from each other. These peak experience, this peak experience, and the question about and how do I actualize that here on the ground? Now, how do I actualize that here on the ground? Leads us again to the question of um, similar to what we've talked about last week, which is Moshe as prophet versus Moshe as as teacher. Okay, so we're going to be looking a little bit about that at that right now um, by looking at the end of the Parsha. So we're, look, we're going to start and begin. We start at the beginning of the Parsha. We're going to go to the end of the Parsha. And then we're going to, part three is going to be, we're going to explore one small set of Mishpatim in the middle to understand kind of how it plays out. If you go to the bottom of the first page, you have Shemot Parak Chafdalet, which on the second side of that page is, is translated in English. I'm going to ask you just to take you know a minute, a minute and a half to scan this so that everyone has a sense of where we're heading with this, just to do that quietly, and then we'll, then we'll start. So this introduction to the end of the parsha, this is the last, the beginning of the last parak of the parsha, um, will lead us. I didn't include all of it in the text, but will lead us to Moshe's going up for forty, you know, forty days and forty nights and bringing down the tablets. Okay. Any questions that emerge from for you from what you read here? Yudahalif is very difficult. Like. What? What, what does that mean? What's happening? Yes, uh, Pasuk 11, right? Upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand, and they beheld God and did eat and drink. We will be talking about that. But I think it's he went up. What does that even mean, right? Now, wh wh one of the things we talked about in last week's Shi'or, uh, which, which I know you weren't here for, I appreciate that you're here today, was um, was this question of what was rabbin the rabbinic imagination of what it meant, where, where Moshe actually went up to. Whereas it says in the text, the top of the mountain, if you remember the Midrash that we learned last week, imagines that Moshe actually went right up into the mountain, into Shaman, into the heavens. But if you look at the beginning of this piece, um, you, it says here, right? A lot of you, many of these elites, essentially, should go up. And then Pasuk Bet, what does it say? What happens in the second Pasuk? Only Moshe. Only Moshe, right? So let's, let, let's, let's try to unpack these things a little bit. And the way we're going to do that is I've decided this time to, it's kind of fun when you have just a five-week a five week series and you can experiment different things each week. Fun for me, hopefully for you also. I decided for this piece, 
to look the, at the, all these questions through the lens of one commentator, and that's Forno. We, we saw him up, uh, back on top, uh, 1475 to 1550, I believe, in um, Italy. And he has interesting perspectives, I think, that bring us back to the question of Moshe as prophet, Moshe as leader. So let's look at what he has to say. The first Sparno that we're looking at is on that first Pasuk, right? On the first verse where it says, Ve'el Moshe Amar, okay? So I'm going to read it in Hebrew. Ve'el Moshe Amar, Ale, Achar, Ve'el Moshe Amar, Ale, I'm sorry, go up. Achar Shesiem, Amru, Kotomar El Bene Yisrael, Atem Reitem, Ufirash Shelo Yalu Elav Ve'em Sa'im, Ve'shiyaspik Mizbeach Adama, Im Shmirat Mitzvotav, Shepirash Kedivot Ve'parashat Amishpatim. אמר הכתוב שכל אלה אמר וציווה לכלל ישראל. ואל משה אמר שיעלה כמו שיעד אליו קודם נתן תורה, ואמרו, ואמרו, לך רד ועלית אתה ואהרון עמך. So this is a little bit complicated. I will look, at, I will look through the English with you a little bit here. So what, what Sparno is saying here is that he had already back in Yitro last week, um, said to him, say to B'nai Israel, you've seen that I've talked to you from heaven. And that at that time, right, he had explained to the people that they, they can't try to reach him through intermediaries, right? The people have to have this connection. But that all was required was an altar made of earth, along with the observance of his commandments as he spelled out in the Ten Commandments in the section of statutes. The verse tells us that all of these things were explained to the entire nation, not just to Moshe, and not even just to these elites, okay? Um, however, to Moses himself, Hashem had said that he should come up, just as he had been commanded to do already before the revelation, okay, when, he, when Hashem said, go descend and ascend and come back up. So, the, what Sparno here establishes is not exactly related to Moshe and Aaron and Nadav and Abihu at the Shivim Zkenim, the 70 elders, but rather the difference between Moshe and the people. Exactly. So the Sparta here is establishing, is, is confirming Moshe's unique stature. Even though he wants the people to know that there's no necessary, in, not, not a human intermediary, right? An altar of earth is all that's needed. And yet, Moshe has special access. Sparta is reminding us here. Now, let's go on to the next, the next piece. Um, let's look at this issue of, of the altar as intermediary. So now we're looking at um, Sparno Chafdalet Vav, that we're looking a little further. This is um, verse 6 in the Sparno. I'll remind you, um, uh, and look at that, I deleted verse 6 by mistake. Okay, so here's what the, here's what, in, um, in Sparno verse 6 of this chapter, um, he, he writes about, the, the, chap, the uh, Pasuk is about throwing the um, blood onto the, onto the Mizbeach, onto the altar. So Sparno 24.6, Chatzi Adam Zerak al Mizbeach, Right, so he converts this altar into becoming the intermediary, the messenger, for the concluding of the covenant. Half the blood was sprinkled on the altar, the other half of the blood is sprinkled on the people. Any sense of what's going on here? Like, what's your reaction to this? Mm -hmm. Hashem has established, bless you, Moshe, according to Sparno, that Moshe is different than the rest of B'nai Israel. That there's no, at the same time, there's no human intermediary that they need to appoint, but rather the altar of earth is sufficient. So what, and what's, so what's happening here? I'm sorry, you started to say something? No. no. Okay. I mean, what kind of animal did they, did, did they use to, you know, sacrifice for the blood? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think this piece is particularly relevant to the animal, um, although there will be many, many portions Why later that Why would they sprinkle be. the people with blood? I'm sorry? Why would they sprinkle the people with blood? Right, exactly, meaning if there's something about, um, if there's something about distinguishing Moshe from the people, then there's something that, then why would the people be sprinkled with blood? In other words, sprinkling with blood has to do with the process of, of, of sacrifice, right, of communication with Hashem, of, of consecrating. So why are these people being sprinkled? Okay, we're going to leave that as a question. I just thought it was an interesting addendum to the first Sparto that we read. Here's I want to I want to take you back a little bit because if you go back to um, to Yitro, when Hashem says to Moshe, "I'm coming to you within a cloud," look at what Sparto says here. I'm going to read this one in English. 
Exodus 19.9. And Hashem says to Moshe, I will come to you in a thick cloud in order that the people may hear when I speak with you and so trust you ever after. Then Moses reported the people's words to the Lord. So in this Pasuk, Sephorno is he's telling us what? He's an intermediary. He's a, well, he's an intermediary, but what's, what exactly is happening? Let's look closely at the words. So that the people may hear when I speak with you. Uh -huh. What are they hearing? Well, that he's words. Right. I mean, we don't, we don't, the Sephorno doesn't tell us exactly what words, but it's not, it, you're right, I think you're right that, that, that Moshe, Moshe is still stuck in a, on a different level than B'nai Israel. but the reason I wouldn't particularly use the word intermediary is because what's happening here, according to Sephorno, is that the people are actually hearing in real time when Hashem is communicating with Moshe. Moshe. So what Sephorno is trying to convey to us here is that Hashem was giving the people sort of, um, a Moshe type experience, right? In other words, the people are not Moshe, and Moshe has to be different. He is a prophet, he is the Navi, we spoke about that last week, in addition to being a teacher. But what Sparno is saying is that back when, when Hashem first speaks to Moshe before Mahmoud Har Sinai, I want the people to trust you, I want the people to believe in me, we spoke about that last week also, I want them to, ex to understand what, an experience, what this experience is. And of course, this is, we know this is not going to happen again and again. It, it, it will not happen at all that Moshe speaks directly to B'nai Israel. But even here, Moshe is not, <coughs> Hashem is not speaking directly to B'nai Israel. They're witnessing a conversation. So it's not exactly a Moshe experience, but it's kind of approximating one. It's a glimpse a glimpse into what Moshe is able to experience, according to Sforno. Now, if we come back, I'm sorry, now if we look at, um, oh, you know what I did? I just, um, I, I imposed Sforno on, on, on that Pasuk because I, I've been I'm learning it together so much. Let's look at the words of Sparno on the bottom because he adds a piece that I didn't just mention. So in English also, in order that the people may hear when I speak with you and trust you ever after, they will believe in the possibility that your prophecy will take place face to face, panim ev panim, and not through dreams. One, um, one of the principal ingredients of this level of prophecy, and now look at this, is a beautiful thing I think that Sforno adds. One of the principal ingredients of this level of prophecy is that the prophet remains in full control of all his faculties. And this they thought was impossible. Mm -hmm. Now they will believe also in you that your prophecy will be in this manner. So why is it, why is it that the Nazarel are getting this glimpse into what, what Moshe can do? Not only so that they can believe in Moshe and believe in the direct communication that happens between God and Moshe, but also so they can understand what this type of prophecy is that Moshe will continue to experience. It's not the prophecies of, it's not the prophecies of, 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 the, of the type that where you kind of are, are not really fully experiencing your senses. It's not the, pro, uh, the type where you are in a different mental state. Moshe remains who Moshe is 100% of the time. Um, and I'm going to now look at the next part of it. For it is not that the people needed convincing that there were people who enjoyed prophetic stature. They knew that the patriarchs, Moshe and Aaron and Miriam, prophesied. I mean, this was very well known. Mo, um, Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron. I mean, these people all communicated with Hashem. That, that they knew by now. However, up until this time, all prophetic messages had been communicated either in a dream or in a vision involving the prophet losing touch with his surroundings at the time of communication by God, which Hashem says in Bamidbar later regarding the prophets. In Bamidbar, you, you can look at this passage if you'd like on your own later, where he says to Moshe, uh, where he says about all, all prophets, but he actually specifically excludes Moshe from this, I will make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak to him in a dream. And then he says, but not Moshe. Moshe is not that. But they would have doubted the type of prophecy of Moshe that he still used all of his faculties had they not also experienced prophecy in that way. Now they believed in the words of Moshe and that no prophet could challenge them, for another prophet's prophecy would not be on that level. So look at what's happening here for Sparno. It's really a beautiful thing. Right? He's saying on the, in the beginning of this parsha, what he's telling us is that there's a way in which B'nai Israel are experiencing, are, are, are distinguished from, from Moshe, right? But they're also experiencing a little bit of their, their um, witnessing what Moshe experiences. And, but what's the reason for that? 
so that they can understand the uniqueness of Moshe's prophecy. He is at once different from them, but also of them. Right? If, he's, if he never loses his faculties, then there's a way in which he's this perfect, inter I'm not going to say intermediary, Sprono identifies, Sprono says no, so he's this perfect leader, he's this perfect prophet, because he's of the people even as he is very unique unto Hashem. Now, any questions before we move on to this, the second passage that, that was mentioned? This, this, uh, yes, so please. It's not a question, a comment. Yeah. When, I, when we were reading this, I was thinking ahead to the classic prophets. Yes. And I think Sforno is, is, is indicating what he's saying can apply to them. Not only the classic ones, even the, even the other ones from the Rebetim Tanakh. By classic, do you mean the later ones? Yishayahu. Well, I mean, well, Yishayahu, Yirmeyahu, Yechezkel, and the Treyasa, but also the others. Um, I don't know if I should go away. Some of the false prophets or those prophets who play a small nice. role. Very nice. And and right. one can apply this these standards to them as well. Right. And it's interesting, um, you know, that that certainly there are there are portions of Torah and and Chazal that address this question of false prophets. If you mm. think about where B'nai Israel are at in their trajectory, right? They're still a newly formed nation. We're just two parshiot away from the huge number of complaints that they have. Yeah. We're not very far. <laughs> we're not. We're not very far past. What are you doing? Bring us back to Egypt, right? They're still trying to figure out Moshe's leadership. So, and so, so I, I like what you brought up about false prophets because it's, it really brings home the idea that. There's still, there's still need to confirm to B'nai Israel, need to confirm to B'nai Israel that this is your guy, right? This is Bayaminu Bashem Uve Moshe Avdo, right? That you, that the trusting has to happen in, in, in me, God, in conjunction with Moshe. And so this idea that Moshe is of them, that he's trustworthy, that he never loses control of himself, of his senses, of his faculties, that he doesn't transcend in that way, you know, it very possibly helps, helps kind of solidify his status within B'nai Israel. That place where you are both um, above the people and of the people, you know, is a very unique place to be if we think about authority in general, right, what it means to be a leader that can relate on both levels, but here the stakes are so high for that to work. They're incredibly high in order for the Israel to continue on what what we know is their what we know should be their path. Um, so that's a really I think that's, that's a nice way to a nice a nice piece to include here is that there, we don't want him to be perceived as a false prophet. False prophets have their own you know very negative place in society and we're warned against them. But this is not what that is. Okay, let's go back to this passage that one of you brought up earlier. Um, Right, the Pasuk 11, where he says, um, I'm going to go back to the Pasuk where the Torah says, upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand, and they beheld God and did eat and drink. So we know that there's some, there's an offering taking place. We know that there's some kind of, um, maybe a celebration, a, a feast taking place. But what does this mean? Okay, so we're going to continue with Sparno here. So this, here's what he says. I'm going I'm to do this part in Hebrew. You can follow in English. Um, okay. Okay. So what's hap what's what's with these what's with these nobles? What is Sforno telling us about these nobles? That Hashem didn't put his hand on them so that they also were able to keep their faculties exactly. while ob observing this whole thing as compared to every other Navi afterwards exactly. which had to lose their senses in order to perceive the prophecy. Exactly. So Sparta is identifying here that it's not just Moshe. Moshe is unique even relative to these others, but it's not just Moshe who has this experience in which he's able to, to have some kind of communication with Hashem, but to still hold on to who he is. Um, and, and it's important that these nobles um, also have that kind of experience. 
Um, the next part is for no by a chazuata Elohim bimar enivu i. Right? They 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 witnessed God. They achieved a vision of God, a vision of their concept of God similar to a prophetic vision. So there is prophecy happening here. He wants to make sure that we understand that there's prophecy ha um, ha happening here. And why vayochlu vayishtu? Why do they celebrate afterwards? Afterwards, they made a festive meal, which they consumed, again, without their normal senses having been in any way transformed. They did this in happiness about what they achieved. So when, when uh, Sparno reads the Pasuk, he didn't put his hand on them to say, to indicate, he, that, he reads that phrase to mean that Hashem did not, you know, with the magic touch, remove their, remove their senses, may put them into an altered mental state that they experience prophecy right now in not equal to Moshe because as we identified from the very beginning, Moshe the, the, the Psukim tell us that Moshe ultimately go up in a way that they don't. So it's not equal, but that quality, to the extent that they did experience prophecy, that quality of holding on to who they are remains. And they're pleased with that. That's why they're celebrating. That they get to have this moment of not losing control, but yes, communicating or, or, or receiving messages from Hashem. So Sparno has this huge vision, right, of, of a Moshe who is, who is confirmed as a leader, confirmed as a prophet, confirmed as a communicator, nobles and elders, which a leader needs in order to kind of be, you know, rank two, um, to keep the nays all where they need to be to help, to help, um, to help judge, to help teach, right? Um, but who are, who are human and the most basic and remain that way all the time, remain in, hum, in human sort of mental state all the time. Yes? It, it's also interesting because of the question that you raised before contrasting um, Rabbi Walfrish and, and uh, Sparno and yes. Ramban, yes. Um, that it wasn't just on an emotional level, they were in full, um, they had their faculties of this on Right, and, and cognitive level, cognitive right? Level. Cognitive level, right? right? Those two things, exactly what you were, the kind of thing you were saying before, right? right? There's the emotional piece, and there's also the cognition, that their cognition was, was intact all the time. And when it's only on the emotional piece, sometimes you're questioned, did right. that really happen? Right, or? very nice, very nice, right? But if you're really aware, cognitively all the time, then you sort of, then belief has to be there. Belief is still a part of all of this, but you know, there's that rational piece that gets satisfied also, right? Okay, good, or that doesn't get challenged. Nice, very nice. For the last few minutes that we have, I want to do part three, which is really disconnected to these two parts, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time, since we have such a detailed parsha, on one set of, of mishpatim that are shared with us. So we're now looking at Shmot Chafet Yutet Tachat. So um, it's, I've listed it here as 20 to 23, um, because you'll, you'll see why in a moment. But it's basically about the treatment of strangers and widows and orphans. So I started it off with Yotet, with 19, because look at the first Pasuk. Zoveach l'Elohim yecharam bilti l'Adonai levadok. Whoever sacrifices unto gods, meaning not the god, but false gods, save unto the Lord only, shall be utterly destroyed. And that leads us into, V'ger lo tone v'lo tilchatsenu ki gerim ha'item v'eretz mitzayim. A stranger you should not wrong, right? Don't oppress strangers. And um, you may notice that the word ger can be alternately translated as stranger or convert. Um, and in some senses, even though this was translated as convert, the, the implication is you were a stranger, meaning you, uh, you arrived in our community as someone not of us, and then you chose to become one of us. Don't afflict that person. 21. Um, Right? Not, just a, not just a stranger or convert, but neither, not a widow, neither a widow nor an orphan. If um, right? I will, I God, will, will witness that. I will hear it if you do afflict him. It's a pretty strong reaction, right? Meaning this isn't, um, we're not talking about someone who murders. We're talking about some kind of affliction, right, uh, to these most vulnerable in society. And the, the, the reaction in kind will be, you, do, you, you persecute them in some fashion, uh, and the Torah knows how to use words like makeh, to hit, it appears in this parsha. it doesn't stay here. The 
Torah uses words like tirtzach, murder, it's not used here. It's some kind of affliction, but you do that to these most vulnerable, and I will make you among the most vulnerable. Okay, so clearly this is a very, very critically important set of, of laws. So let's look a little bit, um, let's look a little bit about in more detail. So if you look at the Talmud in Baba Metzia, here's what we have. It's one of the most famous of all rabbinic maxims, right? Basically, the pot should not call the kettle black. Um, you who have, and not just collective memory of being in the time, you have an episodic memory. You, B'nai Israel, were just there, right? So you, of all people, of all nations, should know never to do this to the most vulnerable. And this word inuyim, by the way, that is that is referenced in the Torah. Inuyim, the sufferings that the Israel experienced. Not just inuyim, though. Also, the word lachat, lo tilchatsenu. Um, the lachat, and we spoke about this a few weeks ago, and I'll bring you back to it a little bit later. Lachat means pressure. I right? don't exert undue pressure of some kind. Also, harkens back to the Israel. So the first thing that the Talmud is underscoring here, right, is why, why is this, we know why this is so important, right, the most vulnerable of society, but, but you, should, you, should, you should know better. You, B'nai Israel, should know better, don't even go there. Okay, let's look at Rashi for this. The first two parts of Rashi actually come from the Mechilta, um, so he, here's what he says. Ger lo tone ona'at varim, velo tilchatsenu begzelat mamon. This is pretty classic. Um, of Rashi and commentary, commentary in general, that if things seem to repeat themselves, or if concepts, even if not the same words, repeat themselves, so we try to understand which each one means. So what he says in, is the first piece of it, don't, um, uh, don't, I'm looking for the English translation here, afflict, don't do wrong, right, to, uh, to a stranger, don't wrong a stranger. He says that with words, right, don't use words, painful words against a stranger. Lot right, don't um, oppress him, that means stealing. So the, the Torah doesn't tell us what it is, but this is Rashi's understanding. So these are the two categories, right? Don't um, bully him, essentially, right, with words, and don't steal from him, don't take advantage of him. This second piece, um, the second piece of Rashi, we're gonna actually look at this in comparison. And I actually took this, this little piece that I'm gonna start right now, I, I, I need to uh, give credit to one of my, my favorite um, um, teachers, uh, not of mine personally, but of, of all of us, Nechama Levavitz, she does a beautiful, beautiful thing here right now. So let's look at this. So Rashi, for you were strangers. So the, if you look back at the Pasuk very carefully, we're going to look back at Pasuk 20 here. Chaf. Right? So Rashi says, don't do this because you were strangers. Look at what Rashi says here. For you were strangers. So right now, what Rashi is saying is pretty similar to you know what we said until now, right? Don't 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 call the kettle black, hot. Um, and um, you know if you do if you do say that to him, he can say to you like, what are you doing? You also come from this kind of background. Okay, and Rashi's identifying his, his understanding of Ger, right? Someone who joined your community. Okay, and by the way, <laughs> one of the important pieces of this um, is that if you look at the beginning, why did I include Pasuk Yotet? Because in Pasuk Yotet, what is Hashem saying in the beginning? If you sacrifice to gods that aren't yours, to God any other than me, then you'll be destroyed. By the same token, if you welcome into the community someone who did sacrifice to those gods, but has chosen not to anymore, I will protect him at all costs. I will protect him, says God, right? In other words, there is really a connection here, right? N neither should you afflict, neither should you um, worship other gods, nor should you reject people who have, who have seen the truth of me. Of me. Okay. Now, let's look at, turn to the, to the next page. In the way that Rashi translates that you shouldn't oppress a stranger in the first, in the, in the page right before, right, is that, is that, um, you know, don't, don't steal from him, and he could easily say to you, don't, why, why are you doing this to me? In 
In Shemot Haf Gimel, so we're going, we're going to, um, earlier in, we're going to Pasuk 9, earlier, um, sorry, a little bit later, it says, it says, this concept comes up again. So here also it says, don't oppress the convert. And this is where Nechama Leibovitz comes in. It's different than saying, it's different from what Rashi says a few earlier on the previous page. It's not, well, he could say to you, there's something much more emotional going on here. You remember, you know what it was like. Right? You know the feelings of a stranger. And if you look at Rashi here on this Pasuk, he, this is what he emphasizes. Um, this, is, this, is, I mean, this, is, um, this isn't analytics. This is, um, this is this is analytics. This is getting into the heart right, of what it means to be vulnerable. You know how hard it is when people oppress a stranger. You understand the soul of a stranger here. I want to take you back to Shmot um, Gimel, at the beginning of this Sefer, before you and I even started learning together, and take you to the word lachatz, oppression. It says there, Right? The Israel's cry has reached me. Hashem says to Moshe, I hear their cry in Mitzrayim, and I've also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So this word lachatz directly relates, this oppression of the Jews and their experience of it directly relates to how we as now liberated Jews, we in Israel, are supposed to um, are supposed to experience this. Here's another thing that I want to say that I think is um, important, which is that the word lachatz, the, the shoresh lachatz, oppression, is used in only two instances in Chumash. It's used in, in later in Tanakh, in Nach, in more instances. These are the two in Chumash. So there's, and, and, and in other words, between Hashem's saying, I, I notice this oppression of B'nai Israel, Lachatz, and Hashem saying now to B'nai Israel, don't oppress, don't use Lachatz against a stranger, it hasn't been used even once, and it won't be used again until Nach. So there's clearly a correlation between what B'nai Israel experienced and what they're supposed to be careful about right now. That use of language, when we, have, we look very carefully at language, and the fre not just the frequency, but the instances of when languages are used, it makes very, very beautiful connections. I also want to remind you that in the first shiur that you and I had together, at the very end, when we talked about the feeling commanded and what we're supposed to feel coming out of, the, of Israel, and what we're supposed to experience at the Seder, aside from the commemoration piece, the commandedness, I shared with you a Rav Kook, where he says, a piece of Rav Kook, where he says, if you look back at the sources, that what are B'nai Israel, what are Jews supposed to experience as soon as, and here he uses the word lachas, as soon as the oppression is lifted, they're supposed to become their ultimate selves. Remember what that ultimate self is for Rav Kook? What's the highest potential that B'nai Israel can reach? Chesed, loving kindness. For Rav Kook, that's chesed. So if you look back here, this set of laws, what is it if not about loving kindness? Other laws here are about other things that are important also. But this Rav Kook connects so beautifully with what we're seeing here, right? That this is about the, the lifting of lachats, right? The lifting of lachats so that Israel can reach their fullest potential of empathy, of true empathy. So it's a beautiful connection. The last source that I have for you, I included because I just think it's so interesting. Um, it, it, it again looks at the, uh, the treatment of strangers and widows and, um, and orphans. It's Rav Hirsch. Um, and what he does is he actually thinks, looks at this through the lens of the state and the individual. And now, if you remember, Rav Hirsch lives, lived before, before, in the 19th century in Germany, before, uh, before there was a Jewish state at all. So he's imagining what it, he's, you know, this is kind of um, the, hypothetical, the hypothetical state, right? In other words, what, what a Jewish polity should look like and how it should function. So um, if you look at this last piece, um, you shall not breathe a state stranger. I'm going to only read parts of this. It is closely connected with a thought expressed in the previous verse, right? And he explains also why Pasuk 19 is, is connected with the rest of it. There it says that even a native-born Jew of the purest descent forfeits his life amidst Jewish national community. Look at the phrases that Hirsch uses, national community. As soon as he departs in the slightest degree from the, from the pure basic principle of Jews' worship of God. 
Um, by contrast, here it says that one who was born a heathen is entitled to complete equality. Look at these phrases, equality and full rights among Jews under Jewish law. Very, very different language than we see in the medieval commentaries. Um, from the moment he joins the Jewish fold and, and by accepting the basic principles. Um, look at the next paragraph. The connection between these two verses mark the great principle, frequently reiterated in scripture, that personal and civil rights and personal worthy do not depend on descent, place of birth, or property ownership, nor do they depend on any external, incidental factor that bears no relationship to the individual's true character. They depend solely on the individual's moral and spiritual qualities. This is a person who lived, who lived before the Holocaust, right? Who lived before, like, you know, the, sort of the worst manifestation of, of racism, of racialism, you know, is that, you know right? Um, uh, that although there, there, there were some experiences that Jews had um, in, in Europe before the Holocaust that had to do with kind of purity of blood, but, but he, was, he was living well before that. And he's still, he's saying, nothing about us essentially makes us worthy or unworthy. It's about who we are. It's about our personality. It's not about how we were born. It's not about um, anything external. It's how we live our lives. How we live our lives make us worthy or unworthy. And how we treat the vulnerable make us worthy or unworthy. Therefore, you are warned. We're warned when you have a state of your own. <laughs> I love this because I, I love this mostly in part because um, because one of the areas that I that I teach and that I've learned studied a lot over the years is Zionism. So when I think about people who are just anticipating this before it's really even a movement, when you have a state of your own, do not make human rights dependent on anything other than the pure humanity inherent in every person. Now. Look at look at 21. Uh, look at the next piece. Now, if you look at, at 20 um, at at uh, 2021, um, which uh, 2021, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bring it there right now because I want to make sure I, I want to respect your time. Um, it said he said it, it's it's written um, in the it's written in the um, in the plural. In most countries, aliens are discriminated against and deprived of their rights by law. Um, one second, let me make sure I'm doing this right. Yeah. Um, by law. For this reason, the address in the preceding verse is in the singular to warn the Jewish state against this practice. Right? You as a unit do not oppress. By contrast, it's hard to find a legal system that discriminates against widows and orphan orphans. Right? However, in social relations and dealings between people, they have no one to stand up for them, to support them, to guide them, and so are subject to discrimination and humiliation. Hence, in their case, the Torah addresses primarily the members of society. Um, but in the next one, he comes back to the state again, right? Um, if, you let, if, if you let him, the, the Torah is in singular here, feel their dependent state. Him refers primarily to the orphan, but also includes the widow. Woe unto you, state leaders, if the state, too, ill-treats them. So he's going back and forth between what the responsibilities are of the state toward the most vulnerable, and within that, of course, how, how people should treat each other. Um, it's pretty beautiful, I think, connections between them and also distinctions between them. Okay. Um, the, the last piece I'm going to... I, I, I did not think I would get to in any case. It's just a Rashi that kind of brings us all together. And a Rashi essentially anticipating or connecting with what, yeah, connecting with what Rav Hirsch, um, Rav Hirsch said. Okay. Sorry, sorry. No, no problem. Um, okay. So what we have here is a Parsha that in its beginning and at its end really helps us understand more about Moshe, more about Moshe's prophecy, more about the connections, and all of that in connection with Mahmoud Harsinai. And in the middle, gives us a, a set of laws, right, a very detailed laws, that within them also have a lot to do with how the society functions, how to treat people, how to be conscious, how to be conscious of B'nai Israel, for, for B'nai Israel, how to be conscious of their own experience, not to let go of their own experience, even as they're becoming a new nation. Now next week, we'll be looking, we'll be shifting gears entirely when we, do, when we look at Parshat Truma, because it's less there about motion leadership and less about B'nai Israel and more about the building of, uh, of, of Mishkan and Mizdeah and so on.